Davos decides what the world should be concerned about, and competition in streaming video heats up. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. We'll sit down with Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. I think was a kind of last hurrah. Harvard University President and National Economic Council Director. The Twitter sphere and America are actually very different places. And Roger Ferguson, TIAA CEO. The thing that's going to drive markets over the next several years is what's driven them in the last several. And former Federal Reserve Vice Chairman. One of the things that's kept rates so low is inflation. This week was the week of Davos, that annual gathering in the Swiss Alps when the great and the good convene to reassure one another that they are both great and good, with talk this year about growth and reduced trade tensions and high hopes for 2020. One of our Wall Street Week contributors, chief Bloomberg economist Stephanie Flanders, was on the scene and gave us this week's contributors' take. They like to talk big here in Davos about the threats the world must confront, climate change, the dark side of the Internet technology turning old business models on their heads. But about the short-term state of the global economy, the conversation here has been remarkably upbeat. But don't be fooled. The past two years of drama have come at a cost. And if we don't pay it in 2020, we will almost certainly feel it down the road. I mean, remember, the U.S.-China trade deal has not removed most of the tariffs the Trump administration slapped on Chinese goods. The average tariff on Chinese imports to the U.S. is now nearly 20 percent, up from 3 percent two years ago. And China has put similar tariffs on U.S. imports. Everyone agrees all the really important stuff has been left for the phase two deal. And there's little chance of that happening this side of the presidential election. And because the U.S. has refused to appoint anyone to the appeal system within the World Trade Organization, there is now no global system for resolving trade disputes. The Europeans say even the U.S.-China deal violates WTO rules. But without that appeal system, it's not clear they could do anything about it, even if they were right. Now to our contributors. With us today are Larry Summers of Harvard, who is not only an esteemed economist in his own right, but the nephew of two Nobel laureates in economics, Paul Samuelson and Kenneth Arrow. What you might not know about Larry, but you should be careful about this, he, as an undergraduate at MIT, was a serious debater, qualifying three times for the National Debate Tournament, which explains a lot about Larry Summers, I think. And Roger Ferguson is with us from TIAA. Roger was the only member of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington when terrorists attacked the United States on 9-11 and drew on his experience with the New York banking system to make sure the financial systems remained up and running to avoid a possible panic. Roger has a long affiliation with Wall Street Week, having watched the original Louis Ruckheiser program with his father as a young boy growing up in Washington. So welcome, Larry. Roger, good to have you here. You just heard what Stephanie Flanders, our contributor, had to say, that things look pretty good for the short term, but if there's a downturn, we're not prepared for it. What's your take, Larry? I think that's about... I think Stephanie was right about that. I thought her comments were, in general, right on the mark. I don't think she's right that it's only trade frictions and the like that explain why the Fed hasn't been able to raise interest rates. Mm -hmm. I think it's the much more fundamental things we talked about a couple weeks ago having to do with secular stagnation, rising savings, diminished investment propensity, all that. And I think we have a deep problem of maintaining demand without having unsound uh, financial conditions. And they should be talking about that in Davos, but I actually don't think uh, they are. I also have to say, I've been going to Davos probably 25 <laughs> of the last uh, 30 uh, years. I missed it this year. And in general, I'm not sure it's a leading indicator. I think it might be a contrary indicator. When Davos is most optimistic, that's when things <laughs> tend to get worse. When Davos is most pessimistic, that's when things uh, tend to get better. So it's a kind of indicator of uh, sentiment. And I think there's a lot to be uh, nervous about, right. both uh, economically, given the level of right. uh, markets, and politically. Right epidemics, uh, 
geopolitical right. uh, strife, all of it. L Roger, I want to pick up on one thing. Larry said it's not all about trade, but people are talking about trade. We had Christine Lagarde give a news conference just this morning, actually, about what was going on with Europe. And this is what she said. She said part of the turnaround in Europe is because of trade. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook <laughs> related to geopolitical factors, rising protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets remain tilted to the downside, but have become less pronounced as some of the uncertainty surrounding international trade is receding. Okay, so how much of the optimism in the economy overall is because of at least a receding of trade tensions? I think a fair amount of it, frankly. Yeah. As one thinks about what was happening last year, uh, a year and a half ago, there was anxiety about recession. That receded. Anxiety about trade as Trump put on more and more tariffs. And indeed, as we got through the so-called phase one deal, my sense is that markets were breathing a bit of a sigh of relief. Having said all of that, if you listen to everything Christine had to say, she also points to a number of other risks, some of which are still, as she says, tilted to the downside. Right. And so if I put Christine's comments in the broader context of what's next, particularly for the ECB, what I take from the entire picture is trade uncertainty perhaps has receded. That might help growth just a little bit. But nothing that she said suggests to me that the ECB is ready to do anything other than re maintain a very accommodative monetary policy. And, Larry, Christine Lagarde and others have talked about fiscal stimulus. Uh, that could help on the demand side, presumably, that you're concerned about. But there's another number you pointed out, actually, uh, in terms of uh, collective bargaining power within the United States and the unionization of workers here. Could that help, in fact, with the income inequality in this country? If we reversed it, it could. We've yes, got a long-term I mean. long uh, trend. Uh, now we're down uh, to about 10 percent of American workers are in unions and only about 6 percent are of private sector yeah. uh, workers are in unions. And we're just seeing constant pressure downwards on wages. And that means constant pressure downwards on the people who have the highest propensity uh, to spend. And that's going to mean more adverse pressure on demand. We've got to find ways of empowering uh, workers mm -hmm. and of pushing uh, wages up. And I wish there was more focus on uh, that crucial issue uh, in all of these uh, conversations. Okay, we're going to be back with our contributors coming up next from Davos to a different kind of entertainment, the kind on film that gets Oscars and Emmys. We talk of the streaming media transformation with Dean of Media Analyst Jessica Reef Ehrlich from Bank of America. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. 2020 is shaping up to be the year of streaming video, and the competition is really heating up. Comcast's Peacock app is the latest on the scene, entering a crowded space already occupied by Netflix, Amazon, and Disney. So consumers who were hoping they might just save some money by cord cutting are now facing the prospect of paying $7, $13, $15 for each of the individual streaming services. But so far, it isn't slowing them down. Bank of America sees people continue Continuing to add to their streaming this year, and that at least three streaming subscription for each of us will become the new norm. And the services appear to be willing to spend whatever it takes to keep their growing customer base. In that critical race to create streaming content, Netflix last year outproduced everybody else with nearly 60 releases. Now, two of their streaming films, The Irishman and Marriage Story, are in the Oscar running for Best Picture. So, whether you've jumped on the streaming bandwagon yet or not, if you're rooting for Robert De Niro in The Irishman, you are a streaming fan. We are back with Roger Ferguson and Larry Summers, and we welcome now our special guest, Jessica Reef Ehrlich from Bank of America. Back when I ran the ABC Television Network and then ABC News, Jessica was the person on the outside we paid attention to when we wanted a smart, informed take on what was going on in media generally, in the companies we were competing with, and I have to say, sometimes even within our own company. She covers broadcast, cable, satellite, filmed entertainment, and now streaming video for Bank of America. Jessica, welcome. Great to have Thank you Thank you so much. What an introduction. Well, oh, my it's God. all true. You know it's all true. So uh, start with the most basic question. Why is 2020 the year? We've heard about streaming for some time now. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You think this is the year. 
This is the year everybody launches. So Disney Plus launched, well, late 2019, but it was an amazing launch. Yeah. They had 10 million subscribers the first day. And way past the estimates. Way past. I mean, they, they were, they've been talking about, well, they said um, 60 to 90 million subs in five years, of which 30% would be in the U.S. I mean, they, they're obviously going to blow past their forecast, mm. not even a question. But then we have Peacock, which is owned by Comcast or NBC Universal, parent company Comcast, launching phase launch April and then bigger push behind the Olympics. HBO Max is launching. So that's just all the traditional media companies have to get in the game. Discovery is launched also in a very different way, but every media company has got to be in streaming. That is, this is the new distribution system. Is this an offensive move or a defensive move? I mean, do they see a lot of money out there to be made? Or are they saying we have to get there because otherwise we lose our base? It, it's both. I mean, it, it, it clearly it was defensive and they, you know, everybody sort of held back, but it takes a long time to have the technology and there's a lot of content. It's not just library content that's going in, but original to keep people on. And, uh, you know, all the strategy, each strategy is a little bit different, but the traditional media companies are competing with the fan companies who have not unlimited funds, but humongous, humongous balance sheets. So can we talk a bit about those funds? Because if one looks at what Netflix has been doing, $3 billion spend, the free cash flow burn rate is pretty high. The market's sort of hoping that it, you know, settles down to only two and a half billion next exactly. year. The, the cost of entry is, is is huge. You've had both content and the technology. So how is this? How does this become profitable for a lot of these businesses? It's, I mean, the, the traditional media companies have given a path to profitability, and they are different. Netflix is spending seventeen billion dollars in cash on content this year, Amazing. and the, and the burn is, as you said, the free cash flow. It's negative more than three billion. Huh. So it's, and that would not be accepted from for traditional media investors. Having said that, there are advantages that the traditional media companies have. They have brands. They have. They have content that they already produce in any case. They have deep libraries. And maybe most important, they have humongous platforms to promote from. So think about Peacock's launch. They will launch um, initially in April and with all of Comcast's properties and its you know, theme parks, films. You know, there, there are a lot of touch points, cable networks. And then when they, they really fully launch, it will be behind the Olympics. 250 million people in the U.S. watch the Olympics. That's an unparalleled platform. When Disney launched, 96% of the U.S. was aware of, of the service launching. So is this going to be a game where scale will win out and, as you point out, the ability to cross market, et cetera? And so if one were an investor, maybe you think not as much disruption as one might have imagined and the big names, the historic names, the NBC Universals, the, the, the Disneys have a real shot at holding on and not being disintermediated. They sort of have been already, and they're right. fighting back. You know, we're going through this transition period, and the stocks reflect. The, we've, in my entire career, decades, I've never seen multiples this low for media. So the stocks reflect the worst, and now they're coming back. So it's defensive, but it's also offensive. And it's, it's really interesting. Peacock had an analyst um, event recently, and it's, it's a different strategy than Disney. And, uh, you know, Disney is sort of... Family and kids and amazing titles, you know, boys with Marvel. You, right. you know what you you know exactly what you Nat Geo. You know, so you, right. you know what you're getting. NBCU or Peacock will have news and sports and you know all of their library and, and original content, but they're also curating stuff differently. So it's you know it's, they're curating channels and it's 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 they actually they have a lot of comedy. So here's my so here's my question. Yeah. Not about this. Not about the stock market. It's like a golden age for the viewer. <laughs> There's Absolutely. huge amounts of stuff being produced from lots of sources, really high quality, seems to me as an amateur, really high production values. Is it economic <laughs> to produce as much new content, as, as many new series, as many new films as are being produced right now? Or are we in a situation like when a lot of new airlines crowd into a route where sooner or later it shakes out and the amount of capacity comes down. Is this a golden age that we're going to remember as being special in the amount of content that's being produced, or is this the new normal? Uh, th there has to be a shakeout. There is no way you can have 500-plus original uh, you know, episodic shows, and, and there's no, just no time for everyone to watch. And, 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 you know, viewers are watching YouTube as well. I mean, there's just, there's just so many options right now. So there, there has to be a shakeout. So it's interesting to see everybody's different approaches. 
um, different revenue drivers. Some is subscription, some is advertising. In the case of Discovery, there's a big piece of e-commerce as well. Um, but there's there's no question that they can't all survive. With all this new competition, is the price for standard properties, a half an hour news show at 6.30 in the afternoon, the, uh, World, Se the World Series, uh, the Masters, the, the NFL, are the prices for those things coming down just because there's so much more stuff, or are the prices going up because they're flagships that will bring everything else in? I mean, the cost of sports. We're all waiting for the NFL to be renewed. Um, there is no way that's going down. There will be a lot of competition. Our view is that it will stay on broadcast TV because of the reach and the production capability. But the digital rights, there's, there's gonna, going to be a battle. Can, but can but there's a real gonna... bifurcation between live sports on the one hand that is much more resistant to some of the forces we've Absolutely. seen as opposed to filmed entertainment. Absolutely. So the sports rights go up, as you said, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, things like that. The, the sports rights are not going down. Yeah. No, they're just not. Can I ask a question? Is this going to go global? We've been thinking about this mainly in the U.S., but there are billions of viewers around the world. Disney, How do we think about it? Absolutely global. Disney is a global brand, right. a well-known, well-loved global brand, and all of their properties, whether it's you know Marvel or Pixar or Disney, or I don't think Lucas is is Star Wars. I mean, those are real, Nat Geo. These are really well-known properties. They'll start to roll out at the end of March in Western Europe and around the world within the next one to two years. Peacock has not said they will, but we believe they will because um, Comcast owns Sky, and Sky is already a very strong television presence and broadband in the U.K., Germany, and Italy. No question in our, our mind that they will go global. So does this end up with, you know, five global brands finding out, maybe not too dissimilar from what happened with airlines, where you end up having a small number of global brands that really dominate? There will be global... There will be probably a handful of, of companies... Um, but we also think that the bundle will be reassembled. So in Disney's bundle is Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. And in our view, in Peacock, we'll see other companies coming in with their content. So it will be a different kind of bundle, but they, it, I mean, it's going to be so con confusing for consumers. Jessica, so when did geopolitics put figure in? We saw this with China, for example, with films, where they really started to take a role in what you could put in the film, what they'd accept in China. India has its own interests, things like that. Is it really going to be global in that sense? How much influence will governments actually have over what they'll allow into their consumer space? There, There is actually already, I mean, there's a certain amount of local production that has to be done, so you've seen Netflix starting up local facilities. Most of the traditional media companies already have that. They, they sell all over the world, and, and many of them have, because that's what people want to see. You, you do have format rights, and you want to see something in your own language with your own nuances. So how many companies do we end up with? Five? You know, Four? likely there are probably five major companies. The, the issue for traditional media is that what drives Amazon or Netflix is very different than what would drive Disney or Comcast or Discovery or Viacom, CBS. I yeah. find it you fascinating name... that you're getting all these things now converging where you've got tech-driven companies, traditional content media companies, all now starting to sort of fish fight in the same pool. It's a fascinating development. It's amazing, and let's see what happens to valuations, because I think traditional yeah. media companies would just love to have the thing type of valuation. <laughs> yes, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, one major player who's a major player, major brand name player today, who's not going to be a substantial factor five or ten years from now. If you had to pick one, who would it be? Um, and know, if you had to pick one... <laughs> that's on the spot. That's that's on if, you the spot. Pick, if you had to pick one who's going to be much bigger uh, five to ten years uh, from now, who would, you bet, who would you bet most on and who would you bet most against? I think that we'd absolutely bet most on Disney and Comcast. And betting against, you know, there are some of these companies I well, don't cover, so I'm going to stay well, away from so that I'll, I'll take it to the hook. Some we're going to have to team up. Some of them are not big enough to make it on their own. I think that there's think. going to have to, they have Disney to scale could, matters. Maybe a Comcast Scalers. could, but the others, they're going to have to get together. More With scale matters. Sort of we will see more in them. But you could also think that as scale matters, but the full vertical integration, the ability to do yep. the content and all the production values and the distribution and the cross-sell and the marketing, that does really suggest something that's really a completely integrated package. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, if you listen to the politicians, they're all talking about strengthened antitrust, more comp more competition policy, disallowing uh, mergers, and you're talking about combinations to avoid redundancy. 
How do you think that's going to shake out? But just think of the competition. How do you define the market? I mean, this is the, right. the issue. There are so many different players. There's never been so much TV production, and it's, it's across a, a large swath of companies. And how do you exclude Netflix and Amazon? And Apple is in the business. And consolidation certainly isn't hurting the suppliers, the writer producers, the actors, the below the line. They're making more and more money. <laughs> making more money. If they're not employed right now, I, you know, I'd, yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd change careers. Exactly. So it sounds like you'd be a, a <laughs> strong advocate of the AT&T Time Warner merger and mergers of that kind as good things. You know, I think it depends. I wouldn't say any one combination, but it, it really depends. Uh, my greatest, you know, the, I really wish that Comcast would have been allowed to buy Time Warner Cable. I think that would have been an amazing company, and they compete with national providers, but it, it wasn't allowed. So it, it's really, it's a very company-specific or situation-specific dependent on how we would come out on that. So as we think about this globally, is it going to be possible to have what I would describe as regional champions, you know, four or five big global brands and then something huge in India, something huge maybe in Western Europe, something huge in Brazil. You know, it's a great point because Star TV, which used to be owned by Fox mm -hmm. and is now owned by Disney, mm -hmm. if, if you were in India, you, you'd think that was a local media company. They have a 40 percent share because it's, it is local in that, in that country, but it's owned 100 yeah. percent right. by Disney. Okay, thanks so much to Jessica Reef Ehrlich. We're going to be back with our contributors. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is the time for Caught My Eye, where we ask our contributors what was important or interesting to them this week. And we're going to start with Roger. Well, thanks. What caught my eye is something I think caught a lot of eyes, which was the spread of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It was described as a mysterious virus in China. First cases shown here. They've been forced to shut down some of the major cities. And what's important about this is, one, hit the market. But more importantly, what does it really say about China for the next 10, 15, 20 years, right? They've got an aging population. There's a real risk that they'll get old before they get rich on a per capita basis. Concerns about the environment, concerns about animal health, now concerns about human health. A very complicated story in China. Coronavirus just simply reminds us of the challenges as well as the opportunities for that really big country. Yeah, it raises some investment questions, and there are investment questions as well about Wells Fargo today. <laughs> what I was struck by with all this discussion of corporate accountability was uh, John Stumpf, the former mm. CEO, of Wells Fargo made what I'm sure was the best deal he could get, and that deal was being banned from the banking industry for life and paying a fine of $17.5 million. Wow. And it points up what CEOs don't actually talk about, but is really a crucial question for our society, which is when corporations do wrong, what do you do? Do you hold the CEO accountable? Yeah. Do you hold the board accountable? Do you find the company? Do you indict the company? After Enron, after the shenanigans at GE, the problems that uh, Boeing uh, is having, the things that went on in the financial industry before and during uh, the crisis, how we deal with corporate wrongdoing is a crucial question in terms of having responsible corporations that I think is going to be much discussed and debated in the years ahead. Yeah, it certainly caught my eye as well. Well done. Okay, thank you so much. So it really was an important development with Wells Fargo as well as coronavirus today. We're going to have more of our contributors coming up next. You can check out what's coming up next on Wall Street Week by heading to Bloomberg Market's official Twitter account. We'll have a poll each week focused on what you'd like to hear from our contributors. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Welcome back from New York. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. The hills were alive this week in Davos with the sounds of what everyone was going to do about climate change, from investment funds talking about what they would and wouldn't invest in, to governments saying how they were going to invest in green, or what they'd already done for that matter, to reports that even the big oil companies were meeting to try to come up with a common approach to limiting CO2 emissions from the oil and gas they produce. Spoiler alert, they reportedly all agreed something needs to be done, but they couldn't agree on what to do. Here's a sample of what we heard. 
given the signs uh, that climate change requires immediate action, this is the decade. And so we wanted to start by saying, look, let's make some good commitments. These issues have moved very swiftly from being corporate social responsibility issues or more niche issues within finance to fundamental value drivers. We will ultimately divest in a company if we really think we're not getting the traction that we need. We do need uh, real breakthroughs. Uh, this is no one company is going to do this. We deal a lot with millennials in terms of the next generation and clearly they are very focused on the um, if you wish, the ethical signature. We've got to set up policies around the world that change the demand patterns uh, of uh, the market because it isn't supply that creates economics, it's supply and demand. Climate change is not going to be fixed by a central bank. And it's going to be fixed by a combination of public and private. We want to invest in clean technology, in uh, green new procedures. We are doing better right now than we've ever done in terms of cleanliness, in terms of numbers. Uh, we have a beautiful ocean called the Pacific Ocean, where thousands and thousands of tons of garbage flows toward us, and that's put there by other countries. It's time now to turn back to our contributors, Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson. So, Roger, I'll pick on you first because this is not new to you at TIAA. You've been involved in this for some time. What do you do and what have you learned from it? All right, so you're right. It's not new to us. We've been involved in climate and ESG issues for about 50 years, and we're really proud to be one of the leaders. And what we've learned over that period of time is you have to take a holistic approach. So first, we are a very large asset manager, and we think about first how do we vote the shares and the proxies. And we're really proud that uh, we voted with uh, shareholder resolutions about 82 percent of the time, much higher than a lot of others in the industry. Uh, and so, you know, the first thing is use your voice as a shareholder to let management know that you care. Uh, the second thing that we've learned is you really are going to have to start to build uh, databases and to really understand and dig in with what companies are actually are doing and use that to engage them on getting more transparency, more disclosure, including oil companies and others. And the final thing that we've learned in terms of this being a, a holistic solution is we also own and manage a lot of assets mm -hmm. and think about managing and owning those in a responsible way, be it real estate, ag, timber. So it's a holistic story here. What a crassy, do you get credit for that? For we investors? get some credit. We have, to be fair, we've got two classes of, of investors. We've got a group for whom ESG, climate, very important, and they want to put their money there. We have a number of others who I think are less focused. One of the things that we've learned over time, though, is all of these factors, ESG, climate, governance, et cetera, important risks to manage. And now we're starting to see the conversation turn towards the fact that this is a positive return generator taking these factors in consideration and creating investment theses around them. So, Larry, can private investment make the difference in climate? I, I think most of what you heard is a pretty total avoidance <laughs> of the real problem and that as long as this kind of thing is the focus, the problem's going to get worse. There are three things that need to happen if the world's going to make real progress on climate, none of which were mentioned by any of those people. One is we need to scale back the hundreds of billions of dollars that the world spends on fossil fuels and fossil fuel subsidies. We need to have governments stop around the world subsidizing fossil fuels and their ability and their use. Second, we need much more invested by governments in clean energies. And the way governments need to get the revenue to make those investments is by levying taxes and having the people and the organizations represented in that video paying more in taxes. And none of them are willing to say that. They'd rather talk about how they've got a hired a, green, a chief green officer and how they're using a little, putting a solar power plant, solar something or other on their roof, than recognize that they need to pay more taxes. And the third thing is we need to tax things that are bad. Right now we have a world that's oriented to taxing things that are good like work and saving, and we need to think tax things that are bad, like putting emissions uh, into the air. So as long as the word tax and subsidy mm -hmm. are outside of the conversation, and it's all just we'll feel better if uh, we do this, the world's not going to make progress in uh, solving uh, this problem. And the president, notwithstanding emissions, the idea is that we're supposed to, in 20 or 30 years, get, emission, get the level of emissions to zero. We haven't even achieved the much more modest goal of stopping emissions from growing 
year after year. So we need to get serious, not rhetorical about this. One of the questions, I, I'm, Larry and I have been friends for a long, long time. We're both economists. One of the things I'm surprised I didn't hear him talk about is price. So most economists would argue, let's first put a price on this. And there's been a big debate about carbon pricing. Is that That's carbon tax? Is that carbon That's tax? Putting a carbon, carbon tax on is, a, you, is you, a price. There's a different way of doing it. You can right. sell the rights right. to right. emit, and, that, right. and the government can collect the revenue that way. But either way, you need the government doing something that puts the price of carbon right. substantially higher. Right. And as long as the United States doesn't increase gasoline taxes from where they were a generation ago, we are fundamentally not serious as a country about this right. issue. And right. it doesn't really matter much what Larry Fink right. Right. says right. in a letter to corporations. Right. Price. Absolutely, Price. And so Larry and I fully agree that part of this is to get the government, the public sector and private sector working well together. And without, our, without a doubt, Larry and I agree that the role that the government can play is creating the right sets of incentives to drive the right kinds of outcomes. That's one approach. The other, and we should think about that. I think there's clearly room for the private sector to find investable, th investable theses and put some private money behind this at scale. Uh, but there's no doubt, this is a, a huge public policy issue that's got to be confronted by both the government creating the pricing mechanism and or tax and the private sector figuring out where to put some capital in order to make a, to make a, a difference here. Roger, as an economist, wave your magic wand, do all the things that Larry just talked about. What does it do to the economy? Because we just had the Secretary of Treasury this week lecture a young woman from Sweden saying, don't talk to me about uh, the climate until you've gone to college and gotten an economics degree. You've got a PhD in economics. So what would it do if we could do all those things? What would it do to the economy? Would it be bigger? Would it be smaller or just the same? Well, first, let's look at what's going on now. So we've already seen billions of dollars of, of insured assets going up in flames, going underwater confronting issues. We suspect that there are probably health issues associated with this. And so the first thing you have to recognize is doing nothing is already increasing costs significantly, reducing the scale of the economy overall. Second point is this is a multi-generational issue. And one of the things that we have a hard time dealing with is an issue where the cost of the present out in the future are the benefits. Right. So the final point is, I suspect over time, it will obviously change the nature of the economy, but I don't see any reason why investing in fixing a major social problem is going to force the economy to shrink. I think that is creating a false trade-off. Hurt, help, or stay the same? Rational climate policy will make us richer and with more jobs, because we'll avoid the damage from climate change, because there'll be new categories of investment mm -hmm. in energy-efficient uh, production, because there'll be new jobs created in, in, in insulating uh, buildings and building more fuel-efficient uh, structures and uh, modes of transportation. It will make us a richer society. Mm -hmm. It will make us a more equal society. And it will bring cooperation on a central planetary challenge right. across the world, which right. is something we badly need from a geopolitical point of view. So, Roger, come back to the market. Uh, Larry says you have to have government intervention, and I think you agree with that. But on the private side, you said actually you can get better returns by investing green. If that's true, why doesn't everybody do it? I mean, people want to make more money. What's the imperfection in the marketplace? Well, to be quite clear, you know, part of the way you get better returns is to avoid some of the risks that are associated with mm -hmm. things that are heavily pollutants, as an example. Um, and so getting that mindset going is really important. There's been a long debate around when that ESG factors can create better returns over time. And I think the, the, the history is starting to show that that's the way that it goes. And so, you know, you get better returns by always managing your risk down. And that's what this story is about. Okay, we will come back with our contributors. Coming up here, we turn from investing in climate to changing operations on the ground. In one of the most difficult industries, Sophia Mendelssohn is here from JetBlue to tell us how she's trying to take an entire airline industry green. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're going to stay on the subject of climate and get a second opinion now that takes us beyond the world of investing in economics to the world of operating a company. Sophia Mendelssohn is JetBlue's head of sustainability. Thank you very much for being here, Sophia. So you're trying to take an airline company green, which doesn't sound like an easy thing to do. 
Well, it's not easy, but that doesn't mean we can't do it and we don't have to do it quickly. The larger the polluter, the more you rely on fossil fuels, the faster you have to act now. And that's why recently JetBlue has made an announcement that we are going carbon neutral on all our domestic flying. We already have a carbon deal for a lot of our international flying, and we see this as the way of, of business going but forward. But how do you do that? Is that, is that buying offsets? And do those really work? Does that really make us carbon neutral? Well, the first step is that you avoid burning fuel where you don't have to. You don't want to spend the money or burn the emissions in the first place. The second immediate step is carbon offsets now. And we've been very clear, these, these work for now, they're verifiable, they're traceable, they're retired on our behalf, they're permanent, and they're also only the first step and certainly not a silver bullet. Next has to come sustainable aviation fuel, a lower carbon alternative to a liquid fossil fuel, and of course, finally, we want to make the transition to electric aircraft, at least for short and medium haul. How do you think this plays into pricing, consumer demand? Are you expecting that you're going to get a bunch of consumers who are going to sort of sign up for that view and, you know, this is a way that they express their support by, you know, switching some of their demand over to your airline? Absolutely. We don't expect it. We're already seeing it. Europe has already seen it. And our job here at JetBlue, my job is to stay ahead of customer demand. We know people need to keep flying. They want to keep flying. Quite frankly, we need flying to keep the global economy together. But let's be real concrete. As I understand, sustainable jet fuel is more expensive than other jet fuel. By the way, there's not a lot of availability, but it's more expensive. Are your customers willing to pay more for their airline ticket because they know JetBlue is green and the next guy isn't? Right now, what JetBlue has done is take care of the carbon on the customer's behalf. We are paying for the carbon offset as a cost of doing business, which it is and which we know other companies are increasingly seeing it as. As for sustainable aviation fuel being more expensive, there's nothing inherently more expensive. There's nothing about the physics of it that makes it need to be more expensive. What we need is volume and we need economy of scale to bring that price down. Let me ask you about something I've wondered about for a long time. 30 years ago, I could fly to Chicago in half an hour less from Boston. I could fly to California in about 45 minutes less. I could fly from Boston to New York in 15 to 20 minutes uh, yeah. less. Some of that's about congestion and landing rights, yeah. but some of that's about airlines fly their planes slower so that they're going to be more fuel, uh, more fuel efficient. Well, that's what people have told me. Mm -hmm. Do you make flights longer on JetBlue no, in it's... order to <laughs> save on carbon emissions and save on energy costs? Could you fly the planes faster if you wanted to? Each airline flies their plane differently. What we're doing is taking care of the carbon on the customer's behalf without asking the customer to make a sacrifice. We're not saying squeeze your knees in or give up first class. We're saying flying needs to happen. You need to be on our aircraft and that creates carbon emissions, which we need to take care of as a cost of doing business. So, how about the speed at which you fly the planes? So, uh, flying slower does, in some cases, save fuel. A much more business friendly, customer savvy way to do it is to buy new aircraft, much like JetBlue has. The new aircraft are increasingly fuel efficient. So, so can we, we talk a bit more about that? So, technology, I'm hearing mm -hmm. ultimately the answer is going to be technology mm -hmm. driving down the need to consume fossil fuels while we're waiting for better, uh, you know, sort of green fuels. What are you seeing when you talk to the providers of jet engines that is yeah. helping us give you some sense of confidence this is going to get better and better over time? Yeah, I, aviation is a bright spot in this. We're not waiting for te the technology. The technology is here. The new aircraft are more fuel efficient. We've already made investments in new electric aircraft companies. Um, the carbon offsets are happening now. That's today. That's carbon being avoided and sucked out of the environment today. Sustainable aviation fuel already exists. It's already safe. We need more of it. We need economies of scale. That's an economics problem, not a technology problem. Sophia, one piece of technology the airlines can't fix on their own is air traffic control. That's true. Uh, if we were to really revamp, which I understand we need to do, it's obsolete. If we were tomorrow to revamp our air traffic control system, how much would it save in terms of carbon? It would be significant, and it would not just save carbon. It would save time. It would save money. This is a really good example of the intersection of business and and government. The global climate crisis is so big, it's affecting us so quickly. There is no corner of the economy that hasn't already been affected that isn't going to be mm -hmm. potentially crippled by it. Everyone needs to be coming with part of the solution. Can I, tell you, can I tell you a story? When I entered the government and we were 
in the beginning, in 2009, the government was thinking about its uh, priorities. I had a meeting as the head of the President's National Economic Council with the CEOs of then there were half a dozen or more uh, airlines, and they all told me we needed to work on the air traffic control system, mm -hmm. and they had a plan, and it was called Next Gen. And the thing about the plan was it was going to take a whole gen, a whole generation <laughs> to years. implement. And I said, if we did this according to your plan, when would we have a modern air traffic control system? This was in 2009. And they said, 2035. Wow. And I said to them, that's really very interesting and I appreciate it. And I know this is a really big, complicated problem. But World War II was a really big and complicated <laughs> war, and it took three and a half years yeah. Yeah. from the time we entered till the time we won yeah. with 12 million people under arms. Yeah. So why was it going to take us a quarter century to get a better air traffic control system. Right. Has any progress really been made on that? Yeah, there's been there's been progress made and I will say, you know, it's not the job of CEOs. No one's ever made money just waiting on congressional action, betting on what congressional action might or might not do. So what we need to do as airlines as the people running the companies today is find the solutions that we can work on today, like carbon offsets, like sustainable aviation fuel. So how about airlines contributing? How about airlines contributing to an infrastructure that would enable them to save fuel costs by not spending as much time circling, that would enable the land scarce mm -hmm. landing slots to mm -hmm. be used? Do you, don't you think the airline industry should be willing to contribute to the airline traffic, air traffic control system we need? Yeah, really? absolutely. We, we have. We have next-gen equipment on our aircraft. You know, that oh. aircraft needs to talk to other parts of the system. Government does need to build out some of that. And every time we land a plane, every time we fly a plane, there's so much going on. There's so many ways that we can be reducing those emissions. And what we're really looking for is the ways that affect the customer today, because this is a customer-driven revolution that we're seeing. So, Sophia, are you seeing action on the part of your partners, the major oil companies, the, the engine companies, those that are manufacturing the planes? Is, is this becoming an ecosystem of folks supporting what you're trying to do and helping you drive it forward? I think there's a lot of room for opportunity there. I'd like to see more of the majors in the sustainable aviation fuel space. There's some companies that have started making it on the smaller side. We're really looking for economies of scale going forward in 2020. And I think 2020 is going to be the year where customers begin to demand but that. But where is big energy on this? Because we heard they just met over in Davos to figure out what they could do about CO2 emissions. It sounds like there's a proposal. So, okay, you want to do something? Here's one concrete thing you do. What did they say when you, when you talked to them about this? You know, they're, they're working on a number of things. Our job in the conversation is to say the demand is here. And it's not just because we're good people who want to mm -hmm. sleep easy at night. It's because our primary fiduciary re responsibility on a daily basis is to protect that share price over the long run. And reducing carbon emissions, taking care of the carbon emissions you can't avoid is part of that financial value. So this goes back to a point we were making earlier. We are talking about good returns in this space. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've just uh, convinced yourself and presumably your shareholders that over the long term, share price would be higher if you become a green airline as opposed to if you didn't. Is that, is, are we reading this correctly? Yeah. I mean, look at the facts that we know. We know that the climate crisis is getting worse. We know that we can't have a global economy without aviation. That means in some fundamental way, aviation is going to have to deal with their emissions. And that's not just our industry, as you guys have seen, as you've said. It's literally going to be every industry. So the price of carbon is going to rise over time. Not taking a stance on that is effectively still making a choice. So shouldn't we, I mean, I, 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 mean, I admire enormously, really I do, what your company's doing and the energy you're bringing uh, to this. But when you say the solutions are customer driven, I actually wonder whether you're right. That's what the tobacco industry used to say. They used to say the solutions to excess smoking are educating consumers about the bad health mm. and consequences and letting it be customer driven. And in fact, it turned out we've made enormous progress, almost none of which has been customer driven. We tax tobacco, we've stopped, outlawed smoking in restaurants, we've outlawed smoking in airplanes. It was basically when we decided it wasn't going to be customer driven, it was going to be policy driven that we solved the problem. And 
shouldn't we not be putting you at a competitive disadvantage if you decide that you want to do the right thing and do complete offsets and your, your airline competitors don't? Isn't the right thing to do to make there be rules so you can do the right thing by the environment and by the future without being at a competitive disadvantage? Don't we need much more active public policy rather than this talk and hopes about private policy? <laughs> well, well, Larry, the kicker is I'm not trying to do the right thing. I'm doing the smart thing, because dealing with carbon is part of going forward for any business. But if we changed public policy, wouldn't the smart thing be much more aggressive if we had a different public policy environment that was putting much more weight behind rewarding those who reduced carbon and penalizing those mm -hmm. who didn't. What I heard Larry say is this is putting you at a competitive disadvantage. Do you think this is putting you at a competitive disadvantage or do you think this is actually giving you a chance to compete and succeed in a way that others aren't? That's exactly right. We see this as a competitive advantage. We've taken a stance on carbon. We've taken a stance on where customers and our shareholders are going in the future and we see a financial advantage to being there first. Sophia, thank you so much for being here. That's thank Sophia you. Mendelson of JetBlue. We're going to final thought from our contributors coming up next. And head to Bloomberg.com for more exclusive thoughts from our weekly contributors, along with full episodes and the official Bloomberg Wall Street Week podcast. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is where we have thought, final thoughts for our contributors. And the real thoughts I had this week was we have an impeachment going on, a trial in the Senate of the President of the United States, and the market is melting up, if anything. So, Roger, how can that happen? It happens because I think the market is priced in what everyone thinks is the most likely outcome, which is that the president is going to stay. Some will agree, some will disagree. But that's really what the market's expecting. I think the thing that's going to drive the market is if there is a surprise versus the expectation. But right now, the expectation is basically status quo. Uh, until we get to the election. So, Larry, is this a little bit like President Clinton in the sense that people sort of looked at it, they say they might not like what he did, but they want to be president and we think he's going to stay? I'm not going to compare Donald Trump uh, <laughs> to President Clinton, who I think was a great and global inspi globally uh, inspiring leader. But, yeah, look, Roger's got it uh, just uh, right. Markets respond to news. There isn't any news uh, in this impeachment. People are very confident about what's going to happen uh, afterwards, and so they're looking to other things, not the impeachment trial. If you got a sudden shock of some kind, something uh, different uh, might, well, uh, might well happen. But I think this is also, we talked about this before, it's just an interesting fact about markets that they are much less responsive to political developments yeah. than people in politics think they should be, yeah. because people in politics think that politics is the center of the universe, and people out there in the economy, <laughs> frankly, don't. Thanks very much for joining us this week. Larry Summers and Roger Ferguson, this has been another edition of Bloomberg Wall Street Week. See you next week.